often write about my family as well. And those of you who may know me either in person or through the extended world of social media know I often write quotes that my nan says, she, my nan says. She's a wonderful lady. Um, unfortunately, she's been really unwell. And this all unfortunately came to a head while I was overseas. So this is an exploration of that feeling. Um, she's still with us, um, but yeah, she's not very well. So go on a journey with me. It's the same as withholding an aspirin. Tell me, you wouldn't give an aspirin to someone suffering. I think back to my first aid training. You actually aren't supposed to give over-the-counter treatments in an emergency, but I think this fact is lost in my dad's analogy. He has this knack for oversimplification, particularly when stressed. I know it's not the same thing, high temperature, infection, convulsing, not knowing the date, the Prime Minister or who you are anymore. She's not really anyone or anything anymore. It's more complicated, I want to say, but instead remain silent, holding space for distant language, holding space for my father, his heavy grief, a family burden. Of course, this happens on holiday when he and I are far away and cannot do anything, Murphy's Law most aptly named. The distance and emotion are crippling. She wouldn't have allowed this, whatever this is. She would have screamed and yelled and done anything for him to get treatment. She had dragged him to seven specialists when he was a kid, one of which ultimately removed his kidney to save him. She wouldn't take no for an answer, but what is quality of life? It's not a dualistic question. My nan has been missing someone for so long, my pa, her long love of kind deeds and complications. It means her physical heart has failed. It always does eventually. It's crying fluid all through her lymph, pulls at her ankles, pushes through dermal impossibilities and forms puddles at her feet. The kind women charged with her care are very kind, but inefficient. She will not listen, she will not do anything. They are obedient and polite and therefore, to her, absent. They miss almost everything and she values troublemaking. When they asked about her preferred care, they suggested, oh, she just likes being alone. So far from the truth, people are everything. She loves conversation, she loves joking and laughing and bossing. After another online family meeting held in eight hours of suspended animation, Dad exclaims, exasperated, the doctor says she's old, as if that's a reason to do nothing. If there's treatment, we should do it. I say nothing again. But I know, at home, Nan is refusing. She is not eating. My sister says she's hoarse from screaming in protest, terrified of nurses, let alone doctors, terrified of death, and not allowing them to do anything. She is actively refusing treatment. I try to broach this sad reality, but Dad won't hear it. Failure of any sort is never tolerated in my family. Ironically, she started it. Dad refuses to see her slipping. We always do eventually. 95 years is not nothing. She's just angry. She's just confused. She's just being difficult. She's only acting. But for now, her heart will have the last word. Her heart or her grandchildren. Thank you. Um, I've got two more and I guess this Second last piece kind of explores the idea in a very rambling kind of way, which is my, um, that's my go-to, the ramble, um, of how bloody privileged we are to go overseas and then feeling guilty for being overseas and then what if you keep thinking about all the stuff for being overseas? Anyway, so me thinking too much, basically. It's called Crazy Classic Life. At the Piazza del Pablo a Roma, at FCO Terminal 3, at all the grandest monuments to man and human history, army green, covered teens, grasping machine guns, albeit casually. And all I want to do, every fibre in my body urges for me to reach out and touch that barrel. We hypothesise the economy did this, perhaps politics. Won't somebody think of the children? And this is not a commentary on anything in particular. It's just the way humans are now. 
we have armoured vehicles blocking pedestrians, keeping cash-wielding tourists at a safe distance. Further north, the police busted an alt-right Nazi sympathiser, nay aficionado, for selling aged missiles, surveilled and sprung on WhatsApp. But me, I'm watching a tiny screen from the cushy seat. It's Tina Vey, she's conveying a bomb-blasted Kabul. This movie is based on a true story, while I make more in-flight plastic to waste another ocean. It's the greed of my tourism. I keep wondering about the weight of that gun, the gall and stupidity required to reach out and tempt fate, the achingly beautiful marble wall, the perfect backdrop for my mind exercise in rebellion. If I wasn't afraid, if I was to tempt fate, what might that look like? My manager's son was locked up in Mexico for eight days in June 2018. His friend had a panic attack in the wrong airspace, wrong place. He stayed with him, gall and stupidity or perhaps blind loyalty. He could not translate the brain pop to the authorities adequately. No speca de inglese went loco. Airport security, insensitive to white nuance and all the perfect ways that the oppressor oppresses himself. Troublemaking runs in my bloodline, but I hate heavy weaponry. I know the cabin is pressurised and any feeble tempting tug on the exit in some hippocampus false memory would yield nothing except a large fine, a court appearance and some very specific bail terms. Matt Damon makes the worst movies. I keep picking them on plane rides as punishment. He went to Mars and in another shrunk himself. Like getting really far away or really small ever taught anyone anything. As if any Aussie accent or mob of heavy-footed tour groups enlightened anyone lately. My stepmom died overseas unexpectedly. No, expectedly. I'm a world-weary cynic in need of a night alone. Is it greedy or just ungrateful being happy to be home? This is my last one and I read it today and um, I know Lish has this really awesome poem that I love about never having been to Europe and I think that's just, it, it really explores the beauty of Australia and I love that poem and I know that I've been crapping on about Europe heaps so I wanted to maybe, I was thinking of your piece when I wrote this, I know it's not as good because I just wrote it today but anyway it's a, it's a little, little taste and maybe I'll play with it later. Since getting home from Europe, I've been sleeping better. Waking each morning, a little less Groundhog Day, grumpy Bill Murray. More like me, who I am really. Since getting home from Europe, I've been listening better. I can hear the Aussie intonation without cringing. I'm loving the lexicon of trackies, siggies and Ugg boots outside. I'm embracing my inner north secret bogan. Since getting home from Europe, I've been reconsidering my relationship with the weather, remembering rain and cold the same way parched soil does. I welcome my wool layers, my beanies, say see you soon to sandy skin and tan toes. Since getting home from Europe, I've been looking better, could be all the water I'm drinking, but what I mean to say is I can see the things I've been overlooking. I can appreciate beauty close to home too. These snapshot moments, the picture perfection, was always here at my feet, was always here dancing at the edge of my peripheral vision. Since getting back from Europe, I've seen my home and I'm lucky I woke up. I'm not dreaming. We have so much and it's home, home from Europe. Thank you.